Hey everyone, it's Jonathan Hayward with Global Infusion. And if you go to Park West Church, I have the amazing privilege to be your missions pastor. Hey, we are in incredible times right now. Ups and downs. I want to thank those who've been praying and giving towards our COVID food and gospel outreach. We are reaching nations. Hey, check this out. Locally, we are also helping a church. We are helping within our own state here in Tennessee. More information on that coming. And we are now in seven, almost eight nations distributing food, getting the gospel out with a couple more nations that we're going to reach this week and next week. Watch for the pictures. Watch for the videos. Be praying. People are in desperate need right now for things like food. And our pastors, our missionaries, our contacts around the world are using food as an open door first to meet a very physical need. People desperately need their food. They need it, and every country is different. You should see what we see behind the scenes of how they're having to do some of this outreach. We were just doing this in Africa on the weekend. There are some locations that they are distributing food where there are 10 people per home. 10 people without food, averaging sometimes 8 people, and they are so appreciative. But when that food is given, the gospel is also given. We are praying for souls to be saved. Let me tell you, the Great Commission has not been canceled. It's not the great suggestion. It's not the great condition. When everything's perfect, then you can evangelize. When everything goes back to normal, there are things that we can be doing right now to impact our world. The world is watching us. The world is listening to us. All right, so keep praying. Keep giving if you can. We're trying to bless so many people, and we love it. We love seeing the testimonies roll in. All right, let's get to today's devotional. This one I call Gut Punch. I have a friend that has a church, and he told me this story one time about this family that was sitting in church one day when they had a missionary from Thailand come in and share about their experience over there. It was a single man, and he was doing some work overseas, and this was a long time ago, 20 plus years ago maybe. And he would show the video, show the pictures, show the kids, look what we're doing. Everybody's so happy. They're praying. They're excited the man's there. So there's this family sitting near the back of the church. And, you know, just an American family. Dad's running a business. Mom's being a mom. Kids are being kids. Just sitting there. No professional vocation of ministry specifically everybody can minister but that wasn't his full-time job and while this man is speaking he feels God speak to him and he turns to his wife and says I think God is calling us to Thailand and she's like uh okay like to visit the man and he's like no to be missionaries to go work with him did you not hear everything that he was talking about how much need is there how much there is to do I feel like God's calling us and she just looked at him she's like this would have to be God because this is not you I will make a long story really short they ended up going to their pastor going through the right channels getting prayed over getting the congregation behind them selling their business selling their things selling their home getting homeschool stuff ready for the kids everything they could possibly do and the day finally came when they had to move so they moved they flew overseas, landed in Bangkok, then flew all the way up north. There's some big cities up there, Chiang Mai, Chiang Rai. They get off the plane, and the man's not there, but, you know, sometimes people are late. So they wait for a little bit. An hour goes by, a couple hours go by, a few hours go by. Finally, the man shows up. Oh, sorry, sorry, I had a lot of things going on. I'm terribly sorry. I got some vehicles here to help collect all your stuff, and we'll, we'll go. He seemed a little bit strange when they were being picked up, but they're, you know, tired from traveling overseas. So they're driving. They don't know their way. They don't know where they are. They see the city. They see the sights. And they're driving for a little while. Then all of a sudden, they just stop in front of this building. They look out to the side. It looks like a church. So he says to them, well, uh, let's put your stuff out here before I show you around and where you're going to stay and everything. It was a little confusing. They're like, why are we stopping here and putting everything out? So they go into the church. The doors were open at the front, one of those kind of churches, and they unload a ton of stuff, and they're just sitting there. And he's like, let's the other vehicles go and the other drivers. And he says, hang on, I'll be right back. So they thought he was just going to go to park. So he drives down the street, turns right, 
and they never see him again, at least not for a long time. They stand there waiting and waiting and waiting. Finally, the pastor from the church comes up to them and looks at them and all of their things and is like, what's going on? And they explain the situation. They've given up their life in America. They came to, the, to this new country of Thailand and they were supposed to be working with this gentleman to do missionary work and here they are and here's their stuff. And the pastor just looked at them and hung his head and was very truthful with them and said, you know, I think I know the man you're talking about. He's not a missionary here. What he usually does is take pictures of him with kids or with people and then goes to the United States, raises all this money, comes back and just lives his life. He might have done something at some point, but he doesn't do any of that now. Talk about a gut punch. Now I want you to listen to the end of this video to find out what happens. Because what the father says next changes the life of his family and hundreds of other people. You know, this made me think of Genesis 28 and the story of Jacob. You see, Jacob was charged by his father to go to another area called Haran or Aram, which is in Syria, to find a wife. And he set out on a journey into the unknown. We are going through unknown times right now. You are going through unknown times right now. So I'm going to go over five things. Number one, the future is always unknown to us, yet it is always known to God. Let me say that again. The future is always unknown to us, but it is always known to God. That's why Proverbs says, Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it's the Lord's purpose that prevails. We think we know what we want to do, and we have these plans, but we truly don't know the future. Jacob, when he set off to find a wife, he had no idea what was coming. He had no idea the impact that would have on his life and then on his generations to come after him. So here's my challenge to you. Make the effort to do what God is asking you to do. When Isaac told Jacob to go, he went. When God asks you to do something, when the future is unknown, when the expectations of something that you are expecting are nothing near the reality like this family in Thailand, keep moving. Do what God asks you to do. Because we all know the rest of the story. There's so many things that happen with Jacob in Genesis. But eventually, obviously, he goes and he meets Rachel. But let's get there, all right? Genesis 28 and 16, it talks about the ladder at Bethel. This is the, the vision that Jace, uh, Jacob has of going up and down and the angels going up and down and God promises something. But check it out. I'm going to read it out of Genesis 28. Even if you read 15, let's go back a little bit. It says, the Lord says to him, Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go. So I'm telling you today, the Lord speaks that to you. Behold, the Lord God is with you and will go be with you wherever you go. So he promises that. But then this is crazy. In verse 16, Jacob says, or the Bible says, Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place. We've all said that. Surely the Lord is in this place. But you know what he says next? And I did not know it. You see, even though Jacob actually knew God, he didn't recognize that God was working right where he was. Jacob knew God. His father Isaac laid down on an altar about to be killed by Jacob's grandfather Abraham. Oh, I'm sure he heard stories. He knew who God was. You and I know who God is, but sometimes we don't recognize that God is working immediately around us. So number two, look around you to recognize where God is working in your life. All right. And Jacob continues. All right. So he gets to chapter 29. He finally meets the beautiful Rachel. All right, so he goes to Laban, her father, and says, Look, I will work seven years to marry Rachel. That's, that's pretty stout. <laughs> All right, Jacob. So he does it. He actually goes, works seven full years. Then the wedding day finally comes. And I'm not quite sure about this. I'm going to ask Jacob when I see him. But apparently he goes through the whole wedding ceremony and everything. And the next day he wakes up, and it's not Rachel. It's Leah. Talk about a gut punch. Imagine working seven years for a person because you love them so much. And then marry, go through the whole marriage ceremony. And, oh, it's not, it's not that person. Jacob had very direct expectations and it did not meet the reality. Over the last few weeks, have you had expectations? How many of them turned out exactly as you thought they would? The things you planned, the things you heard about, the things you're reading... How many of them actually happened? 
But listen, if Jacob's story had to end it there, it would be a terribly sad story, but it's not. It continues. In, in Genesis 29, Laban allows him to marry Rachel, okay? Because originally, he says, the reason that you had to marry Leah first is that's the way we do things. There is an order to this that I failed to mention. The first daughter has to be married first, so now you can marry Rachel. And he says, okay, I'll marry Rachel, and then I'll stay with you another seven years. So here's a key point. This is number three. When expectations do not meet reality, you have a choice. You can be paralyzed or catalyzed. Now let me read you a definition. Paralyzed means to be rendered powerless, ineffective, and unable to move. Catalyzed, totally different. It means to be the cause of something, a cause of a situation, an action, a state of mind. Jacob chose, when he saw Leah, not to be paralyzed. He knew God was with him. He began to recognize God with him. And he chose to catalyze the situation and be the cause of something. I'm going to move forward. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep working because I know God's hand is on my life. And I know that I want to marry Rachel. So I'm going to fulfill my duty. So he does. So in Genesis 30, 25, Jacob has completely filled, fulfilled his pledge to Laban. And he says to him, send me away that I may go to my own place in my own country. So now he's worked 14 years and he begins to do these things which we can talk about with these speckled goats and sheep and lambs and rams and all these things. He gets his flock together, it really grows, and in the, it outgrows Laban's. And in the middle of the night, he runs away <laughs> with everything, with the wives, with the kids, with the goats and the sheep and everything. And Laban wakes up one day and says, where did Jacob go? And they're like, uh, I think it's about three days ago he left. So Laban pursues Jacob. He runs after him. And he, because he left without warning, he's like, what are you doing? Jacob begins to worry. So he's already seen God working in his life, but he still worries. What he doesn't know is that God came, comes to Laban in a dream and says, don't touch Jacob. When Laban finally gains on Jacob and meets up with them, they end up making an incredible covenant naming it Mizpah. Mizpah, this is in verse 49. It says, May the Lord watch between you and me when we are absent from one another. Now, Laban was upset that Jacob left, but he's like, Look, God told me not to touch you. I have every right to. It says that in the Bible, but he doesn't. So he's like, Let's make a covenant. And what a great covenant. We should Mizpah. I don't know if that's a verb. We should Mizpah one another. May the Lord watch between you and me when we are absent from one another. And Jacob ended up worrying for nothing. So you'd think he'd learn his lesson. Well, we don't learn our lesson sometimes. Because in cha chapter 32, here comes Esau. Remember the guy he stole the birthright from? Yeah, here comes Esau. And he's like, oh no, <laughs> Esau's coming after me. So what Jacob does is he sends his servants with tons of animals, wave after wave. He's like, send, go ahead with all these sheep and goats, go. And then a little bit later, somebody else goes, then somebody else goes. So all these presents will land on Esau so that he's able to be calmed down. Well, while he's doing that, he ends up wrestling with the angel. His hip gets touched. His name gets changed. He's like, man, how much more stuff can happen to me? But in Genesis 33 and 4, Esau shows up and Jacob is freaking out. <laughs> but the Bible says Esau ran to him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and wept. Number four. God is your defender. Jacob was worried about Laban. He was worried about Esau. And God was already working. He works on your behalf even when you don't see it, when you don't feel it, and especially when you don't believe it. God is still working. Hey, let's flash back to Genesis 31 and 10. Do you know why Jacob's flocks outgrew Laban's? You should read this. Chapter 31, 10, 11, and 12. God gives him a dream and a strategy in the midst of a gut punch. In the midst of expectations not meeting reality, God gives him a strategy on how to grow his flock, and he ends up outgrowing Laban's by hundreds, if not thousands. And the angel of the Lord talks to him directly in a dream. It's amazing. So even during that time, God spoke to him, giving him insight and favor. Things that would happen in the future, he gave him favor in the middle of all that. So here's Jacob, who eventually becomes Israel. He becomes the father of the 12 tribes of Israel, which we all know. He is in the lineage of Jesus. If Jacob had have been paralyzed instead of catalyzed, all of that could have stopped. So here's number five. Live your life for Jesus as if the world depended on it, because it does. 
What Jacob did, his actions, his decisions, ended up changing the world, creating the nation of Israel, the tribes of Israel, being in the lineage of Jesus. You are important too. The decisions that you make during this time, be a catalyst. Don't be paralyzed. Move forward. So here's a quick recap. Number one, the future is always unknown to us, but it is known to God at all times. Number two, look around you and recognize where God is working in your life. Number three, when expectations don't meet reality, you have a choice to become paralyzed or catalyzed. Number four, God is your defender. Say it today. God, you are my defender. Five, live your life for Jesus as if the world depended on it, because it does. I promised you I'd tell you the end of that Thailand story. Here's that family standing in the middle of a church. They've moved their lives from America to Thailand. They've been bailed on. They've been conned. It's the most incredible gut punch. Their expectations were nowhere near the reality. And the father looks at the family and says one statement. This is a man that hasn't been trained in seminary or grew up vocationally in, in church and just been a pastor. He was a humble man who served God. And he looked at his family and said, who called us here, God or a man? And when they realized that it was God that called them and not the circumstances around them, they fulfilled the dream and the vision that was placed on their life. They ended up staying in Thailand. They ended up creating a group home for kids, evangelizing in neighborhoods, affecting thousands of people most likely. They turned a gut punch into a victory. And today, when your expectations don't meet your reality, you can change all of that and live victoriously for Jesus Christ. I want to encourage you, keep praying. We love you. We're praying for you. We're helping to change nations together. If you want to pray for us, please do. We have teams that are ready, locked and loaded to come up in the next half of the year. We are still doing that food outreach. I want to hit all of our nations. So if you can give, please do. Check the links, whatever you can do. Everything's going overseas 100% immediately. Please be praying for our people around the world. The Great Commission is not canceled. We are still going to change this world for Jesus. And I'm praying today that you will live victoriously, even when expectations don't meet your realities. Jesus is on your side, and you can live in victory.